Welcome to our third lecture of the semester for commercial space flight operations and uh, communications. Uh, today we're going to review the first quiz. Um, I pulled this off a little earlier than the quiz closed, so if you were a last minute uh, addition, I, I don't have your feedback uh, incorporated in here, uh, but you get a gist of, of the responses. We'll talk then for most of the class about government involvement in space, specifically uh, in the United States. Uh, we'll touch a little bit on international involvement and the class talking about nonprofit uh, involvement. So folks who are either uh, charitably giving or as individuals are engaging in, in space activities. So I pulled uh, some data just so you can kind of see where the responses of the class shook out based on uh, what everyone said compared to, to where you guys are individually coming to the course from. Uh, so the first question uh, is res with respect to how much experience you have with aerospace engineering. Uh, and so as you see, about 40% of the class uh, has extensive experience. Uh, a little under half has minimal experience, and about uh, two of you at this point uh, have no experience with aerospace engineering. And you can see basically the opposite is true uh, for telecommunications. So one of you has uh, extensive experience with telecommunications. Uh, about 70% have minimal experience, and uh, about 25% have no prior experience. And so this gets to the idea of an interdisciplinary class. So if you are in a uh, you know this this category or this category, uh, it's where you'll have maybe a little bit of background reading and googling to do on certain topics. But in general, I'll try to introduce everything from a, a, an accessible enough level uh, that even if you're in one of those categories, you'll be able to pick it up and, and understand the concepts. So then one of the next questions was, why did you take the course? Um, and so just to give you guys a little bit of sense of why folks took the course, uh, practical experience and insight, kind of re repeated over and over again, industry perspective, uh, to help my career or to get, get a job or to, to figure out where to apply for a job, um, to understand the commercial industry, commercial slash industry perspective. Uh, and then I think the most colorful one here is, it's sexy and I'd like to work in this field. So I want to understand what, uh, what's going on. My next question was what your expectations were, um, and I think these aligned well with, with what we're going to teach, so either you fed me back my bullet points or you're in the right class, uh, and that is to relate or communicate with industry uh, as an expectation to understand the impact of business and regulations on industry and what type of things you can accomplish. Uh, to learn from the experience of others, so I think this will be a big piece of sort of the last part of the course where we have industry come and talk, so that's good. Uh, and then to obtain a broad perspective of different companies and enti entities and how they operate. And so I definitely hope that uh, even already you guys are starting to see the you know, different sizes of companies and different activities that are, are being conducted. Subjects that you'd like em emphasized. So I think we cover most of these, uh, but that includes the future prospects of NASA and industry. This one was almost unanimous in the first couple of years that we taught the class when people thought NASA was going away and commercial was going to replace it. Uh, I think most of you and what we've talked about understand that NASA is not going away, so that's good news. But uh, it's maybe partnering with industry a little more efficiently than it has in the past. Um, we want to identify trends for the industry, so what we're talking about in the first part of this class, and then we'll hear, hopefully, uh, corroboration of that, those trends from when industry lecturers come and speak to us. Human spaceflight, always uh, of, of interest. Uh, regulations, um, it still amazes me every year. People are, you know, they'd like to emphasize regulations. Uh, so like ITAR, export control, and, and FAA regulations. We, we'll have some of that. Uh, how will companies lower the cost of launch? Actually, three or four of you were talking about lowering the cost of launch. So uh, we'll get into a little bit about that in the launch uh, lecture coming up, I think, uh, uh, in a week or two. Safety, kind of broadly. Uh, three or four people interested in in-situ research utilization or more explicitly asteroid mining. So I think those are pretty uh, exciting topics we'll touch on uh, a little bit in the early part of the class. And, and as I mentioned, I think having United Launch Alliance come in and talk about some of their ideas for lunar resources will probably be the, the sort of marquee lecture on ISRU. I like this last one, and uh, per someone is expecting or, or is looking for uh, ammunition to argue why space is worth it. So try to give some good reasons why uh, in discussions with people space is relevant, both economically but also for national security and, and other reasons.
Uh, and then we asked sort of what prior experience, uh, if any, you, you might have had with commercial space specifically. So the vast majority, the answer was there really wasn't any experience, which is totally fine. That's why we're in this course, right? So we'll provide some context. Um, some experience uh, folks had for both in-class and distance students uh, working with commercial entities through either internships or employment or uh, as like where a commercial industry might be a customer or a provider. Um, so folks who maybe have worked at government entities. And then one response, which was that, you know, the experience of commercial space is many hours reading about Elon. So somebody has a, a crush. Um, but uh, we'll talk about how that fits into all of the industry uh, trends and activities. Uh, and then one of my favorite questions is, would you take a trip to space? So this year we actually had a pretty diverse amount of answers. Uh, usually it's, it's like everybody says, hell yes, and one person says no. There's always a no. This year, as of when I pulled the numbers, there were no no's. So good job, class. Uh, the, ma the vast majority, though, absolutely uh, would take a trip to space. Uh, a couple had a caveat that they would take a trip only if it was for something useful, not, not just for entertainment. So they were worried about the, you know, the appearance of going to space maybe as being a little too flashy. Um, a couple are applying or have applied to be an astronaut, so I, I guess that's a yes. Um, a couple uh, pointed out that they would go to space but not as a one-way trip, which I thought was funny because we didn't ask about one-way trips, so a sensitive topic, I guess. Uh, and so one person has already started packing, so I don't, I'm going to figure out who that is because I want to know what you pack uh, uh, to start going to space, but uh, I thought those were good responses. So that's sort of just what you've told me about what you're interested in, what your backgrounds are, uh, and we kind of use that as a starting point, map that. Uh, as everything I saw through there, there's nothing really that doesn't align with what we're going to be covering and, and, and touching on, so hopefully... That means that everyone that responded uh, is here for the right reasons and that it'll be a good fit. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll have a couple more of these uh, quizzes where you get credit by just providing your input and feedback uh, as the semester goes on so we can kind of gauge how things are going. Um, and then we'll pivot or, or alter as needed. And also, uh, if there's ever an issue that you're having, please feel free to reach out. Uh, it was one of those quizzes, I think, two years ago, uh, where someone pointed out that they hadn't gotten a grade for, like, the first lab or the first assignment, and it was an oversight by the, the TA. Uh, and so you, know, you don't have to wait till the quizzes. If you have feedback or have concerns or questions, please feel free to email me. So now we'll get into what are the roles of government. Uh, I'll uh, warn you that there's going to be a lot of org charts <laughs> throughout this to try to understand who reports to who and how everything works together. Um, and I'll also warn you that some of those org charts are impossible to keep updated. So I, I make no, uh, no guarantees that the names in those org charts are correct. Uh, we're going to try to hope that the roles and the positions and the titles are correct. And you'll see what I mean with some of these uh, org charts. So as we ended, uh, as we spent most of last class talking about kind of following the money, I like to sort of set a context of where is money being spent uh, in space. And this is a, a global... Uh, breakdown uh, by region from uh, the Tory group, uh, and this was from, I think, a year or two ago. I don't know if it has a date on it. Uh, but roughly speaking, uh, the assumption here is that U.S. and Canada has 50-plus billion. Uh, it's a hard number to peg and pin down, as we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, there's a sizable amount of U.S. government investment in space that's really highly classified, and uh, I haven't Googled through all of the, you know, WikiLeaks stuff to figure out what those numbers are. Um, somebody probably could do that. Um, but uh, so we sort of are going to use a rough number, about a $50 billion uh, U.S. and Canadian investment in space. We then look around sort of the other regions. So Europe collectively uh, is putting in about $11 billion, So that puts them sort of number two spot. Uh, Russia, Ukraine, Central Asia grouped together here uh, and uh, sort of regionally about $6 billion dollars. Um, China, about $6 billion, but sort of similar to the United States. Uh, a lot of their civil and military space are kind of one and the same, and they're, they're not published budgets, and they're not so transparent. So that's a, uh, I've seen that number vary quite a bit, but we sort of will use the Tory group's assumption here, about $6 billion. Uh, Asia Pacific is in there at about $5 billion. Uh, Africa as a continent, uh, about $60 million. Uh, and South Asia here is about 1.3 billion, and then we look down uh, to Latin America, is about half a billion, and Middle East, about 600 million. So just to give you kind of a sense of where's money being spent in space, um, 
the, the areas I think to keep an eye on uh, are some of the sort of South Asia and Asia Pacific uh, are areas where there's uh, investment and, and a little bit of com, uh, competition going on between uh, sort of China, Japan, and some of those regional uh, operators. The Middle East uh, has been getting active in some of the countries like United Arab Emirates uh, and Saudi Arabia have been pending deals with satellite companies to develop partnerships and, and to do uh, some exciting stuff, so I expect those numbers to be increasing. Um, in Europe, I think, will stay about $11 billion, but that's, to me, sort of an interesting one because they're going through a lot of transitions um, between new launch vehicles, new uh, leadership at the head of the European Space Agency, and so there's a lot of uh, maybe variability within that $11 billion potentially on where it'll be spent, uh, and some of that will crystallize later this year uh, as the Europeans will be doing their, what they call their ministerial uh, which is a minister from each of the countries and members of the European Space Agency, will be coming through to sort of give direction and approval for projects. We'll talk a little bit more about how that works. So that, kind of broadly speaking, was sort of the government slice of the pie. If you remember before, we had we talked a lot about the commercial piece of the pie. This is sort of that government uh, sliver. This is uh, an org chart, which uh, no, I have not updated personally, uh, but it's the best thing I've been able to find to cover every part of the U.S. government that has to do with space. Uh, and so uh, up here at the top, we've got the president, you've got different departments, NASA, national security, and sort of this whole side over here uh, is Department of Defense. And what we'll do uh, through the United States piece of, of figuring out who's doing what in space, we'll sort of step through some of these blocks uh, and give you a little bit of context on who's doing what and, and how they're organized. Um, but the, the short answer is almost everything that the United States government does has some involvement or relationship to space, whether that is just a, sort of an attache between departments to figure out you know, how to use satellite data, or that's something like you know, the National Reconnaissance Office, which is really focused on collecting intelligence from satellites and overhead. So we'll start with... NASA, which is highlighted here, um, was created in 1958, uh, and I, what I pulled out, um, which I'll point out is amended, so this language is not all from 1958, but just to give you a sense of what is the, the charter or the task of why NASA is created, what is the you know, written down objectives, uh, and the, it's the, you know, the, the NASA administration, uh, is supposed to carry out you know, aeronautical and space activities pretty broadly uh, arrange for the participation of science, so that's where we see a lot of science and, and outreach, um, provide the widest practicable and appropriate dissemination of information. So this is where you know, NASA TV and all of the scientific publications that, that NASA supports come from. And then the last two are the two that I like the most, especially in the context of this class, and that is to seek and encourage to the maximum extent possible the fullest commercial use of space. So NASA has as part of its charter uh, to support the commercial use of space. Uh, and then furthermore, uh, to encourage and provide across the entire federal government the use of commercially provided space services and hardware. And so I think those are pretty uh, you know, notable that they're in there. They were put in there specifically uh, to make sure that, that there is justification for using commercial suppliers and commercial products. Uh, and across the government more broadly, there is a lot of restrictions between the government competing directly with commercial providers of services. So to me, this is... This is sort of, if you go to first principles, so the fundamentals, why should NASA care about commercial space? Well, it's because they have to. It's part of their job. So here's a, an org chart um, showing sort of how NASA is organized. Um, you kind of here have your NASA headquarters administration. So there's the administrator and the deputy administrator uh, because these topics will be coming up uh, in the next year with the presidential transition. Uh, the administrator and the deputy administrator are appointed by the president uh, and uh, approved by Congress. The associate administrator, so sort of the number three person, is actually a civil servant. So they're there uh, unless they get re, you know, transitioned or appointed. Uh, and down here, when you sort of understand how everything reports, you can see why that's such an important position. Um, the associate administrator is who all of the mission directorates. So right now, NASA has four, which is aeronautics, human exploration and operations, space technology, and science. So each of those four mission directorates report to the associate administrator and all of NASA's ten centers uh, or nine centers in the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Those all, all report up through to the associate administrator. 
Why that's important with this sort of upcoming uh, transition is that the associate administrator will, in all likelihood, be the same person. So there's continuity uh, in, in the sort of highest level of NASA. And then the administrator and deputy administrator, if we look here at the color coding, the light blue, so you've got your sort of chief scientist, chief technologist, chief engineer, lots of chiefs, report to the NASA administrator. And then the mission support directorate, which is a lot of sort of the uh, administrative overhead functions of NASA, uh, as well as uh, legislative affairs communications, they report through the deputy administrator. And so uh, you'll see when, when, we're, when the you know, president really, or whoever it is, ever really pays attention to NASA, usually they're going through their political appointees, who's going to be either the administrator or deputy administrator. Uh, and then pretty much everybody else in this architecture uh, except for some folks in legislative affairs and sprinkled throughout, are civil servants who have been there for a long time and will probably be there uh, longer than the administrator. So you can imagine, and uh, some of our guest lectures might get into this, that if you try to change the policy of an organization as big as NASA, has one or two people at the top, where everybody else who's been there uh, doesn't agree with what you want to do, it's not always the quickest transition or change uh, of direction. So if we zoom in a little bit, um, we talked uh, last class about uh, commercial crew and commercial cargo. And so those fit into <clears throat> sort of the human exploration and operations mission directorate, um, where you've got the ISS National Lab uh, reporting up through space life and physical sciences. Um, there's an advanced explorations group. So these are the folks looking at what do we do beyond Earth orbit. Um, the commercial spaceflight development division uh, human spaceflight capabilities, exploration development. So this is where we're looking at how are we going to do human exploration and how do we do ongoing spaceflight operations. And so this area uh, has a, a big stake, obviously, in the International Space Station and in the future crewed uh, activities for NASA. Um, we'll talk a little bit about, like, launch chain of command. And so this is who approves and who reports to different folks on the actual act of launching uh, a mission or a spacecraft. And a lot of these, um, you'll see down here, uh, are provided by uh, a, f a good friend who works for NASA Launch Services Program. Her name is Janet Karika, so there's your sort of credit. Uh, Janet is a meticulous note taker of all of these crazy intricacies of who reports to who and who goes where and why. Uh, and so she provided these, um, and, uh, and so I thank her a lot for that, but that's sort of the reference. A lot of these you can't Google, you know, NASA Launch Chain of Command. So that's why this is sort of notable and interesting. So the main thing here is that the top of the, the chain of command is the NASA administrator uh, who, you know, so everything kind of goes through the associate administrator uh, for human exploration and operations. And so you see you've got uh, what we had here before was a commercial crew and cargo program office. And so the reason why it's shaded uh, is because it, the program was accomplished, as they say, right? And so it became an operational commercial resupply services that reports up through the transportation office to the International Space Station, uh, and then it became sort of the commercial crew program. So this was sort of the incubator for those two programs, and once they incubated, they uh, dis disbanded that, that part of the tree. Um, so commercial crew uh, comes up through uh, commercial spaceflight development. Um, you've got sort of the launch service uh, program, uh, which is where a lot of the like science payloads, I think they just announced that the Mars 2020 uh, lander, or rover, whatever it is, uh, is, uh, is be the launch contract was just awarded, so that would go through this, this division here. Uh, and then the space launch system and future you know, launch vehicle developments would come up through the exploration systems division. So these are all the different people who have uh, opinions or, or weigh in on, on launch. And so obviously there's a group for exploration, for commercial space flight and humans, for science, and for International Space Station. So we'll zoom back out again. So we were in this box here looking at NASA. Next we'll look here at the Department of Transportation uh, where we have the FAA. So this is the U.S. Department of Transportation. This is, so we zoomed into the FAA. Uh, and we look at this sort of eye chart. You guys all have this. Um, but you've got, like, this is the chief uh, counsel. This is... Uh, uh, the head of the next gen, so the air traffic control group. Uh, here's finance and management. And I'm telling you these so you can see they have these huge org charts, right? 
And then uh, this is the Office of Commercial Space Transportation. Uh, it doesn't have any fun uh, people below it, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. So put to provide in context, again, kind of following the money, FAA's total budget, uh, and these are in uh, abbreviated, so it's about $16 billion uh, over the whole agency. Um, and we see you know, operations, so that's your sort of air traffic control, is about 21%, it's so about $3.3 billion. Um, facilities and equipment, about 2.6. Um, we've got the big uh, fish here, which is sort of grants and aid for airports. So it's almost $10 billion uh, contributed to airports. So that's sort of how they break it up at the top level. And if we zoom in uh, on this operations budget, oh, sorry, operations budget here, we see that the commercial space transportation piece wouldn't even show up on the pie chart uh, when I tried to create it. So they are 16.6 .6 million of a 16-ish billion dollar agency. And they're the only people in the FAA that are looking at anything related to space. And they're also the only people in the U.S. government who can approve commercial space launches. So just to give you an idea, when the FAA is talking about space and anybody above the associate administrator is talking about it, uh, it's a big deal because that agency is so focused on air travel and, and focused on air traffic control. So as we did with uh, NASA, we'll talk about sort of what are the mission goals for the FAA. Office of Commercial Space Transportation, and I'll point out uh, every, I don't know if it's on this chart here, every one of these groups has a designator, so this is like a ARP, AVS, ACR, AFN, so it's some FAA rule that every subdivision has to start with an A, okay? So that's why it's AST when it's the Commercial Space Transportation, or you'd think maybe it would be FACST, it's AST, which is just sort of a uh, org chart thing, I guess. I, someone told me why once, but it was too silly to remember, so it's just ASD. But you'll see that throughout. just want to make sure you understood why. So they have two roles, uh, and it's kind of interesting because it's the only part of the FAA that has this dual mandate. Uh, the rest of the FAA used to have both of these, but, but it was removed. So the first mandate is to regulate the commercial space transportation industry. Uh, the key here that I emphasize, emphasis is mine, only to the extent necessary, so not you know, smothered in the cradle, uh, to ensure, and this is really important, that, so their role of regulating is to ensure compliance with international obligations. So the United States signed on to treaties that say we're going to do certain things in space, and it's the FAA's job to make sure we comply with those treaties. It is to protect the public, health and safety, and I emphasize that because it's not to protect the participants, it's to protect the public, so it's to protect people who decided they didn't want to be involved. So uninvolved public. The safety of property. So again, not the vehicle that's flying, but what damage can that do to other people's property? As well as the national security and foreign policy interests of the United States. So if you're a commercial operator, the FAA, and, and you wanted to do something like send a weapon of mass destruction into space, it's the FAA's job in their payload review to prevent you from doing that. The, the duality, though, that, that, again, the Office of Commercial Space Transportation is somewhat unique in having is that they're also tasked with this role of encourage, facilitate, and promote commercial space launches and reentries by the private sector. And the uniqueness of this comes from the fact that the broader FAA used to have the same mandate to encourage, facilitate, and promote aviation, uh, and there was a series of accidents uh, you know, a couple decades ago, and they figured out that really the problem was that the FAA more broadly, was too interested in facilitating and promoting and not in regulating. So they removed the ability, they were, they were getting too cozy with the people they had to regulate, right? So they were overlooking things, they were bending the rules, so they said, no more. Uh, but for the FAA, uh, Office of Commercial Space Transportation, they retained that, uh, and it's, it's very, and understanding what happened before, it's very tightly separated. So the folks who are in, char in charge of encourage, facilitate, promote are not at all involved in any of the regulatory stuff. So you can imagine there's a little bit of friction between the people who are like, dude, just let them launch. This is really great for the industry on the encourage, facilitate, promote side. And then the, the regulatory side who are like, ah, I don't like this. It's not safe. We're not going to do it. So there's a, a healthy tension, they say, but a really strong firewall between the two groups. So what kind of stuff does the, that office do? Here's a map of all of the uh, active and proposed commercial orbital and suborbital launch sites. 
Um, it's uh, from last year's report. It does not include, so I'll add it, uh, the West Texas facility, which is where Blue Origin launches out of, and the McGregor facility for SpaceX, which I think is somewhere in there, roughly, um, where uh, SpaceX does uh, and did some of their suborbital tests. So there's a little bit of irony there that the two most active places where people are launching stuff are not on the map. But, um, but what you can see here is that uh, a lot of the orbital facilities um, are pe places that are looking to go to orbital, as you can imagine, sort of around the coasts or, or islands or Alaska. Uh, and a lot of this inland area are suborbital vehicle proposals, uh, this exception uh, of down here where the uh, SpaceX is working on their uh, Brownsville uh, launch site to do commercial launches from South Texas. So to give you an idea uh, and a quick shout out that Colorado has a proposed spaceport right next to uh, DIA. So if you ever, and I think they're actually out there uh, recently, they've been doing some uh, rocket engine tests. So if you see like a cool plume of smoke when you're flying in, uh, that might be what's going on, hopefully. The, uh, it's not something more bad and sad. <laughs> um, the other thing that this chart shows uh, is that almost all of the orbital launch sites uh, as you can expect, are coupled with the red dots, which are federal sites, uh, except this is one of the unique things for SpaceX down in Brownsville. So what that, there's a sort of two edges to this sword. We'll talk a little bit about it when we get to launch vehicle operations. Uh, but traditionally, the U.S. government, primarily through the Air Force, will invest in the radars and the security and the range safety mechanisms. Uh, so if you're going to launch commercially, you launch on those sites and you pay sort of a user fee to the Air Force to do that. The other side of that, though, is that if the Air Force ever has a national security mission that conflicts with your commercial mission, which one do you think goes first? The national security one always trumps your commercial mission, uh, and the national security folks uh, are not necessarily working 80-hour weeks uh, like some folks in the commercial side would be. Uh, and so if they you know, have work, if they've worked for like three days in a row, they have to take two days off because they're working 24 by 7 shifts. So anyways, there's a, a pro and a con to it, and so SpaceX is sort of investing in their own facility, which won't have some of those uh, requirements from uh, dealing with the Air Force and, and range safety. We'll see how that plays out. So in terms of what the, about regulating space, this is uh, a graphic um, from the FAA compendium report that looks at everything sort of from what happens on the surface uh, all the way up to GEO, uh, and I guess probably soon we'll have to include beyond GEO, uh, as the FAA did a, a payload approval for a, a lunar lander mission recently to basically state that it was going to comply with the treaties that the United States has signed. So we'll step sort of through this so you have an idea of who is in charge of what. Um, and again, this is all available to you so you can go back and, and, and remind yourself. So. Um, before we even get into space, uh, there are the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, which are managed by the State Department, uh, which are anything that could be military, which is a lot of stuff related to space, or dual use. Uh, and then there's the Export Administration uh, Regulations, which are managed by the Department of Commerce. So both of these are considered, are concerned with how does technical information or know-how uh, pass through borders uh, or across borders. And so, you see, even just in understanding what can you tell people, you have to check with two different agencies, the Department of State and Department of Commerce, depending on the topic. Next up, we have the actual sites, so uh, where people are launching or re-entering uh, for suborbital or uh, the operations of launching to orbit or re-entering from orbit. Uh, all of those operations and the sites they're conducted at are regulated by the FAA. So they're the ones who are going to give spaceport licenses and approvals, uh, and also they're in charge of uh, commercial reentry events. So every time the uh, Dragon brings back supplies from the International Space Station, they have to get approval to make sure where, when they come back down and where they come back and how they operate that is safe and doesn't have uh, problems for, for folks on the ground or aircraft. If you're going to do a commercial launch event, so to, to orbit uh, or suborbit, those are also permitted uh, or licensed by the FAA. We'll talk uh, briefly about the difference between those two. Um, so you can see the sites and the activities of launch or reentry very clearly uh, FAA domain. So there's a little bit of, of clarity there. Then we'll move up. Oops, wrong way. Uh, to anything in space that wants to take a picture, uh, 
uh, of the Earth, if it's being launched or operated from the United States, uh, it needs to be licensed from NOAA, so the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And if you want to talk to the spacecraft or vehicle that's in space, then you have to be licensed by the FCC, uh, who manages the spectrum rights and, and utilization. So now you're starting to see, if you have a space mission, you have like several parts of the government that you have to deal with, right? There's not really clearly a one-stop shop. Question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm still trying to Google this out, but I haven't been able to find the answer. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens if you are launching a satellite and you are from Earth? Or so the FCC is not controlling you. Great question. So there's something called the International Telecommunications Union. So I'll skip forward to the next chart. Um, and so internationally, there's the, the ITU is the, the acronym, and they govern sort of how spectrum is allocated uh, globally. Um, they also allocate where you can put a satellite in geosynchronous uh, orbit. And so they set sort of the, the broad rules, and then they say within these rules, each country has an equivalent of the FCC. So every country has to have somebody who uh, approves and how the spectrum is split up in their country. So um, you know, Europe, for example, would have their own rules about certain frequencies, that how they're split up, who has rights to them, and who can use them. If the, what they call landing rights, so if you're trying to broadcast into Europe, you would have to get their approval. So like, if you launched your satellite from Russia and it was built in Europe and you have no United States influence on the launch or operations, but you want to send a signal to a United States terminal on the ground, you have to get FCC approval. So you can imagine if you're trying to do like a global constellation of communication satellites and you want to land in every country in the world, there's a lot of paperwork. A lot of lawyers, yeah. Right, right. And then you also have the, the concern that, that it's not, uh, you know, satellite spectrum in the United States might be, uh, you know, TV spectrum in China and might be something else in Russia. So, so there are some common bands that ITU designates so that, that, you know, for example, like scientific experiments, if you're doing radio, uh, you know, remote sensing, are not always disrupted, but, but not everything is controlled internationally. So countries and, and, and regulatory agencies have a lot of uh, power over that. And a lot of times they'll become kind of regional, though, too. So uh, Europe, I think, has a, like kind of equivalent to FCC. <clears throat> so great question leading into sort of what happens out at GEO. And so, again, the slots. So where can you put your spacecraft are uh, determined by rules set by the ITU. And these are things like uh, which frequency and how much power are you operating at and so that you don't have uh, side lobe interference. And so they'll sort of put two spacecraft operating at different frequencies can be basically next to each other. But if you're operating at the same frequency, there's set spacing that you have to observe. And then uh, if you're communicating from GEO to the United States, then you'll be licensed by the FCC. So this sort of these this kind of build up just gives you a sense of all of the different places you might have to go if you wanted to do an entire N10 mission between export control, whether that's state or commerce, between the launch operations, which would be FAA, between if you want to take pictures, it's NOAA, if you want to communicate with it, it's FCC. And there's sort of an area here that's ambiguous, right? And so that area is who's in charge of just general operations on orbit. And so at GEO, you have slots that are determined, but what if you're not in a slot, right? If, what if you're operating in LEO or mid-Earth orbit and you're not taking a picture? Uh, your mission is maybe to go to the moon, like I said earlier. So there's some ambiguity that is, they're working on solving right now of what about on-orbit operations, right? So what if I have a private space station and a private launch vehicle and a private crewed vehicle? Who tells me uh, where I can fly and what I can and can't do, right? Who's the traffic cop? if you'll think of it that way, that's doing space traffic. Uh, and so space traffic management, huge issue right now. Um, some folks at the FCC think that it's sort of their job. Uh, a lot of people at the FAA think it could be their job. There's a lot of uncertainty. Uh, but the one common thing that I, I think we'll talk about uh, in about a month, uh, we talk about space traffic management, orbital debris. The common thing, though, now is that universally the Department of Defense does not want to be the traffic cop in space. Uh, they have been for like the last several years, 10 years, they track everything in space and if they see something that might hit something else, they send a notice and they say, 
hey, we don't really want to tell you too much, but we're, if you guys don't do something, you might hit. And so they released that information. As you can imagine, uh, a Chinese company or a Chinese government entity or any other country in the world, probably not so thrilled about getting phone calls from the Air Force telling them that we know exactly where your satellite is and it's probably going to hit this other thing, right? So the idea is if you could make that a civil agency, it would make commercial companies in other countries maybe more comfortable uh, coordinating and interfacing. Yeah. Yeah, that's the primary thing. There's a new one uh, called Jixboc, which is basically trying to do the same thing with different tools uh, in kind of a more or I should say a less restricted environment. But yeah, JSPOC is primarily uh, who's doing the orbital analysis and then contacting people about conjunctions. And we'll have a whole lecture kind of about that problem. It's a big, hairy problem with lots of hard technical uh, challenges. So uh, as Dr. Bourne used to say, that's sort of job security for, for students if you find hard problems that need technical solutions. And so the process that the FAA goes through um, to do a, a licensing or permitting, um, they look at, so they get an uh, application submitted, and they go through five levels of review or five sort of considerations. So first one is a policy review. Uh, so does this activity that you're, you're proposing impact any major policy constraints? They look at the payload, and they look at the payload not necessarily to tell you whether they think it's going to work, but they look at the payload to make sure you're not violating any rules or you're not, like, launching nuclear, you know, materials or something that, would, would really give a lot of people heartburn. Um, they do a financial, financial responsibility determination. So this is to basically make sure you have the appropriate insurance and that if something goes wrong, the operating entity is you know, financially solvent enough or insured enough to, to pay for the damages to uninvolved parties. They do an environmental review, and, and primarily that's looking at launch operations, so they're making sure that whatever the launch vehicle, however it operates, it's not creating a, a major environmental impact. And then they'll do a safety review, which is mostly looking at, again, the uninvolved public. So is this rocket launch uh, going to pose a risk to people that's, that's not, um, not considered to be uh, appropriate? And then based on that review, they'll either issue a license or a permit. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit, I think, in the next chart about the differences. But so the things that they review, uh, launch and reentry, um, so suborbital and orbital, uh, expendable launch vehicles, air launch, uh, this is something that has been a bigger thing, right now isn't so much, might become a bigger thing again. Um, the sites that, that launch and reentry <coughs> happens at, uh, human space flight, and we'll talk a little bit about how they're involved in that. And then sea launch, which uh, currently in bankruptcy, but it was sort of an interesting one because it's a, it was a U.S., uh, based company owned uh, at the end uh, by sort of a joint venture between the Russians and, and Boeing, uh, and they towed this platform out in the middle of the Pacific. It was totally not in, in, in United States airspace or waters, but because they were, they were operating from California, they had to be licensed by the FAA, which is sort of interesting. It's probably the, one of the easier reviews to do. <coughs> There's really nothing around there. So I kind of put this up there for you to, to come back at, but the people who need licenses are any company, any United States company that's operating inside the U.S. or outside. So if you're a U.S.-based company operating uh, outside the United States, you still need a license. Or if you're a foreign company who wants to operate inside the United States. And a big piece of that is that there's treaty designations called the launching state. And that's how it's defined as. So the, the obligations of the United States for the actions of people who launch is a launching state from here or are based here and launched somewhere else. That's the, the, one of the main designators. Um, and then again, any U.S. commercial launcher reentry sites. Um, and, and these licenses are for sort of recurring uh, or for operations, so they can be amended uh, and they can be recurring as well. Um, and the FAA also created uh, several years ago these ideas of experimental permits and amateur rocketry. Um, the main thing here is to support uh, research and development. Um, and so the, the distinction, though, is that you can't make money under an experimental permit. So if you wanted to do like a suborbital human space activity, you can do R&D and crew training and all this stuff under this experimental permit. But as soon as you want to start doing it for a profit, you'd have to move over and to get a license. The difference there just being more paperwork and more thorough review. Uh, the idea that if you're experimenting, there's a little bit more wiggle room with doing new things that are maybe not tried and true. But if you're operating under a license, then there's a higher expectation of, of quality and, and understanding. So just to give you a sense of what, 
what people are, what the FAA has licensed, uh, and this is from 2016. Um, we have uh, their orbital launches, and so these are the list of all the folks that operated uh, orbital launches. So we've got M SpaceX and Atlas, um, and then this is an idea over sort of the last several years, the trends. So you look back in 2011, um, the number of commercial launches in the United States was one, right? Last year we had 12, this year eight, or I guess two years ago, 12, last year eight. And so this is, and if you kind of look at it, this is the time period where people are like, commercial space, kind of what's going on, uh, and, and why are we funding it, and what is it a big deal? Uh, but, but this sort of peak, and, and it's, you know, hopefully keeps going up, uh, is what's been hard in terms of regulatory funding and, and general support for the FAA and for commercial space has been having the patience to wait for the, the spikes that are, that are coming down. Uh, in terms of suborbital, I combined here 2015, or sorry, 2014 and 2015. Um, and so in, you can see in 2014 it was pretty active uh, with several Falcon 9 flights uh, testing their, their sort of hopper uh, vehicle to look at their reusability and landing out at, at the ocean or on ground. Uh, and then you had uh, the two, uh, that year, Spaceship Two flights, uh, the second one, uh, the accident that uh, has now delayed them. Hopefully they'll be returning to flight soon. Um, and then in the last, in 2015, we had um, a pad abort test um, from SpaceX, which was considered a suborbital spaceflight activity, so they had to license it. Uh, and then uh, two flights were conducted by Blue Origin. Uh, obviously, two more since then. And I left this up here. Uh, this is from 2014. Uh, but in addition to the launch sites and the launch activities, the FAA has sort of gotten in the business uh, of doing uh, safety approvals and experimental permits. So this was um, both of these two kind of things to highlight are companies that uh, you know, got approval one day apart so you know they were probably kind of competing. Um, we're looking at training for space flight. So this is basically the FAA saying, this facility has been approved, safety approval to train people for, for these experiences. And there, I don't believe there were any of those last year, so we'll see how that evolves. So the, the law and the regulations of commercial human space flight. So um, the idea of a space flight participant and really the idea of commercial human space flight at all uh, really came out of the Commercial Space Launch Amendments Act in 2004. Uh, and if you remember in 2004, uh, is when the Ansari X Prize was won, this was like a, you know, everybody expected that the suborbital spaceflight with humans was going to be everyday occurrence any day now, right? So they have this new law that came out, um, passed in, in 2004, uh, and it gave a regime for commercial human spaceflight. So you can imagine new capability, uh, thanks to Bert Rutan and his team, scaled composites to send people to space. They wanted to start selling tickets. Um, and if there had not been this regime, the idea was, who would invest in a suborbital company, right? Why would Richard Branson create Virgin Galactic if there was no legal way for him to send people to space, right? So the, the, the rules in this case had to come first in order for anyone to want to sink an investment into a, a commercial venture. And it's one of the things that has attracted commercial interest from around the world to the United States because it was the first and has been a leader in, in writing these rules. And so... Uh, again, we talked before about the idea that the FAA should only regulate to the extent necessary. That was carried over here um, to this idea that, that you know, the regulations should neither stifle technology development, but also should not expose crew or spaceflight participants to unavoidable risks. And so I, I highlighted this, and I'll make a, qu a quick you know, statement about it, because this is sort of the ongoing tension of commercial human spaceflight, is there's a camp that says the government should not get involved until... The industry is operating and flying and knows exactly how it's going to operate so they can write rules that are tailored for those systems. And there's another camp that says without rules ahead of time, people are going to die and things are going to be really bad and it's going to be the Wild West. And, and so somewhere in the middle is the appropriate balance. But you'll see in a lot of legislation and a lot of talks, um, people are really careful about how much regulation they want and how early they want it and, 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 what, uh, and what order of operation should be. So... Right now, I think there's a pretty good balance, but it's just something that if you're in these conversations and you're at these events, you'll hear this sort of tension of, of opinion. And so <clears throat> that act uh, expired 
uh, or was, was set to expire, um, but was renewed or was extended um, by the Commercial Space Launch Competitive Act, uh, which was signed in 2015. Um, and the reason why that was important was that this, this regime that was created basically said there's a learning period uh, until, I think it was 2015, uh, the FAA cannot make any rules unless there's an accident. So this is the you know, extent of let's figure out how to do suborbital spaceflight before we write the rules of, of, of suborbital spaceflight. And so, again, remember, 2004, everyone expected these to be starting you know, within 18 months, right? So <coughs> still 18 months away. So they extended the, the learning period. Um, and so that now uh, extends to 2023, again, until there's sort of uh, better information or, or any sort of accident. So that's the regulation side. Those are the rules guys who, and girls who approve or, or say no uh, to things they don't, they don't like. The other side is the encourage, facilitate, promote piece. Um, and this uh, is led by the director of research who reports up to the chief engineer of the office. Uh, and this director of research, uh, we're working on scheduling him to come out. Uh, his name is Ken Davidian. He's, I think, lectured almost every year. And his job is to oversee uh, the research activities of the Office of Commercial Space Transportation. So you can imagine an, an entity that's tasked with regulating cutting edge uh, technology and new stuff that's changing all the time uh, really needs to have a focused effort to understand what's going on and, and what the implications are for safety. Um, and so the, 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 the other key piece of this is that, as we talked about, I think, in the first class, the Center of Excellence for Commercial Space Transportation is what created this course. Um, and we are one of those member universities here at CU that is informing kind of the FAA side of, of what's going on. Uh, additionally, um, there are research entities like the reports we've been referencing uh, that come out to provide information about what's going on in the industry. Uh, and these are some of those tools. Um, I've been referencing a lot this annual compendium uh, of commercial space. They release it every year. It's on your uh, D2L uh, as one of the resources. And these have a lot of the charts of who's launching, where are they launching, how often. This also has a pretty comprehensive appendix of every launch vehicle, or most launch vehicles, their performance, where they operate, and what they're able to do. So if you're thinking about, all right, I'm going to plan a you know, satellite constellation, who can I buy a rocket from? This would be a place to start to look at who's operating uh, rockets that can achieve the, the orbits that you need. Uh, as we also talked about before, they support these forecasts of market demand to try to understand uh, where is the industry going, what is the viable commercial operations and activities that, that could be of interest. <clears throat> and I think I mentioned this, but this is the center of excellence research areas, which is basically everything uh, in commercial spaceflight. Uh, and this course kind of lives in this fourth one, which is supporting industry viability. So now we'll step through sort of the other org charts and, and other components of how the, how the U.S. government's involved in space. So we see the uh, Department of Energy uh, here through their lab, Sandia, Los Alamos, and Lawrence Livermore um, are doing research uh, in a lot of different areas, but one of the areas that I've seen published work on is orbital debris. Some of the computational modeling is coming out of the Department of Energy labs. Uh, we've got Department of Commerce. So we've got NOAA here, as we talked about, regulating all commercial remote sensing. Uh, we've got <coughs> the Office of Air and Space Commercialization. So there's sort of another office in the Department of Commerce, small office, looking at the commercial activities in space uh, and how those interface with the U.S. government and different regulations. Uh, and then also Department of Commerce is where part of the Bureau of Export Administration lives. So this would be the commercial products, uh, which... Uh, include space, but also include electronics, and uh, you know there's designations for everything down to like a T-shirt. So you have to have uh, approval to export things from the United States, uh, even if it's pretty low tech, just in terms of uh, monitoring uh, whatever government things they monitor. Um, the Department of the Interior is looking at uh, you know satellite data and the geodetic survey. Department of Justice, uh, FBI uh, is involved or is exposed at least to, to using space. Department of State, um, you've got the Office of Defense Trade Controls, and this is where ITAR lives, uh, and those are the folks who are, are the administrators of, of ITAR. 
Um, then you've got the Bureau of Intelligence and Research and Oceans, Environment, and Science. So again, sort of users of uh, space data. Uh, we've got the Office of uh, the Department of Transportation, which we just talked about, as well as the Federal Communications Commission, FCC, so those are the folks regulating all of our spectrum and frequency uses. And then we've got the giant interconnected org chart of all of the ways the military uh, is involved in space. We've got the sort of first break here is the intelligence community on the left and the sort of defense community on the right. We'll see there's a lot of overlap and, and crossover. Uh, you've got the uh, CIA, the National Reconnaissance Office, which uh, I'll share with you my favorite thing was uh, a, an NRO guy, uh, and obviously the you know, Air Force is also doing stuff in space, and they said the difference between the NRO and the Air Force is that we both have great technology, but the NRO gets to pimp the ride. So, like, they get to put all the latest and greatest gadgets and gizmos and stuff on it. Uh, and launch ridiculously expensive spacecraft that I'm sure are highly capable, but they're also highly classified, so we don't know what that means to pimp your eye, but you can use your imagination. Um, so we've got Air Force, Navy, Army, all have very different commands and, and centers and operational places where space is, is incorporated into how the, you know, the Department of Defense uh, plans and, and, and procures and does whatever they do. Um, one you'll hear about uh, a lot in space is DARPA, and so their goal is to develop tactical technology, um, and the, the saying there is that anything they work on has to be DARPA hard, and so the idea is that they're trying to attack or, or they're trying to uh, find technical solutions to impossible problems, um, and so a lot of like reusable space plane technology, there's a program there, um, satellite servicing, there's a DARPA program, uh, there was a DARPA program that uh, has been sort of changed a little bit, but that they were going to go actually harvest, like go take an antenna off of a dead satellite and go take solar panels off a different one, <coughs> and like kind of connect them and do like a Frankenstein satellite. Um, and they got decently far in that technology development. Uh, one of the inside kind of things that you, if you deal with DARPA or hear about DARPA, is that they pull in external, what they call program managers from industry, from government, uh, bring them in, and they have two years to accomplish something. And basically, like, so everyone comes in, they have their pet project that they want to focus on, they have two years to execute it, um, and then they leave. And so you see a lot of these programs which start huge, like, decent funding, really exciting stuff for, like, two years. That person leaves, new person comes in, looks at it, it's not really into it, and changes it. So there's a lot of uh, investment in really high-risk technology and maybe a lack of continuity, but just that's in general. So don't quote me on that. <clears throat> Let's see, what else? So there's a lot of, like, so SMC down here basically procures all of the launch vehicles and satellites and test programs and ground segments for the Air Force, which then, you know, feeds up to the Secretary of the Air Force. Um, and then there's a lot of coordination. So you've got these cross-cutting bars between the Air Force and the National Reconnaissance Office, the Navy and the National Reconnaissance Office. So they're sharing kind of assets and, and lessons learned. But these are all of the, the different ways that the Department of Defense is involved in space and, you know, kind of loosely thinking that this is like, there's like $30 billion somewhere through here in space activities. So the, the viewpoint of space, this is uh, uh, a few years old, but I really like the contrast, so I kind of keep bringing it up. Um, and that is the, the, the way that space has changed from a defense perspective. And so in sort of 1960 time frame, there were two nations in space. That's it, right? The focus was the Cold War, which was fought in sort of a civil war race to the moon, or sorry, civil race to the moon, intelligence, uh, the idea of a missile gap, so we were worried that the Russians might have better missiles than we did, uh, and we're trying to <coughs> monitor that from space. In the military sense, they're trying to deter nuclear war, and the only real commercial piece of space was the idea that Tang was invented, uh, you know, from the space program. Um, at the time, an adversary wouldn't attack your space assets because the implication was if you attack a space asset that was sort of linked to nuclear warfare, so we're going to keep our hands off, we're not going to, you know, get involved in space uh, uh, physical or radio frequency uh, interference. Um, the industrial base um, was sort of growing from 
very little at the time. That was part of the goal, was to grow it from nothing. So there was a high priority for resources, uh, for you know, people and, and financial and, and physical resources were all pumped into space because it was such an important thing. And there was really no foreign competitors, right? Um, and the real framework that was being used at the time was the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Uh, and the strategy from a military perspective was unilateral dominance. So we just have to be the best, right? And you fast forward, and the frameworks down here and the strategies were the same, but in 2010, obviously you have multiple nations and entities operating in space, commercial and governmental. Uh, the idea, the focus really is, is transition from a Cold War to this idea of space for the masses. So civil is focused on exploring, intelligence is counterterrorism, military is, is looking at how do we transition things from troops to civilians, uh, and commercial, we're talking about sending people up, right, who can buy a ticket to, to go to space. The, um, the challenge now is that uh, instead of, of linking attacks uh, in space to nuclear warfare, now they're attacked uh, uh, attacks are actually justified by links to commercial warfare. So before, the idea that nuclear was involved meant we're not going to mess with your space stuff, you're not going to mess with ours. Uh, but now, because satellite communications and GPS are so important to the just day-to-day -day conventional warfare, that they're now targets for jamming and for physical interference. The industrial base, the space industry, is no longer like kind of the point of the spear for everyone's focus, right? So we have to compete for resources with Google and Facebook and all these other folks, uh, and there are definitely foreign competitors. So the main takeaway from this chart is a lot has changed, uh, but in 2010, the strategy was the same. And so this is where the Air Force, uh, and the, the Department of Defense, has been sort of pivoting uh, to focus on uh, how to operate in space more effectively, and they've kind of boiled it down to these catchy three Cs. Uh, which is congested, contested, and competitive. Uh, and congested is, uh, and these numbers are a couple years old, but you know they, they track 22,000 man-made objects in orbit um, that are the size of a softball or bigger. Again, we'll talk more about this later. Uh, the expectation is there's probably hundreds of thousands more that are smaller than a softball, um, but could still be a threat to take out a satellite. Um, and the number of transponders or the amount of radio frequency communications in space is over 9,000. It's contested because uh, there's a lot of ways to interfere with satellites that don't necessarily require you to be in space, so whether that's laser or radio frequency jamming. Um, uh, and the, the jammers themselves are pretty cheap and, and getting inexpensive. And then uh, competitive, this started, starts to also get into the sort of satellite manufacturing market share. Uh, even in the 90s, you know, we were pretty dominant in the United States. Uh, international competition really picked up, uh, and so there's some con concerns there about industrial base uh, acquisition, production rates, um, and again, challenges recruiting and, and developing and retaining a qualified workforce. So that's why we're all here, right? That qualified workforce. So the strategy shifted then to sort of strengthen safety, stability, and security in space. Um, with the idea that nations need to share this sort of shared uh, responsibility for the space domain. And so uh, one of the reasons why the Air Force and the United States government care so much uh, is because in many ways the United States has the most to lose in sort of a space. Uh, if there's collisions or, or, or anti-satellite stuff, so they have a kind of a vested interest, which is in some ways a positive spin because they have a, a high give a shit factor, right? They really don't want to have a space taken away from them. Um, they need to maintain and enhance the, the national security advantages, um, which is space users across all of the, the aspects of the military, um, even if the space environment is degraded. So these are some of the things they're thinking about. And then uh, the industrial base is a big concern um, to, the, to the government because we've talked about, right, the government wants to be able to buy things at an incremental price and not have to like keep entire companies in business just to provide what they're what they're doing. And so there's a, a high high relationship between commercial uh, and government space activities because you can get some economies of scale. So here's another uh, chain of launch chain of command, um, and this is where you have sort of the Secretary of Defense at the top. Uh, the takeaways here, I think, at, at a high level, you've got sort of a military chain of command uh, here on the left and a civilian chain of command here on the right um, where the you know, joint chairman of the Joint Chiefs is the top of one and the Secretary of the Air Force uh, is the other. Uh, a lot of these interrelationship things like space situational awareness, these are sort of the, the responsibilities that are passed up from the positions throughout the military and Air Force structure um, that you have here as a reference, um, but I don't think we need to necessarily step through all of them.
much more simpler, because we really don't know anything about it, uh, is the National Reconnaissance Office. Um, so the Director of National Intelligence um, sort of conveys the launch uh, priorities to the director, and then there's a Office of Space Launch uh, that is in charge of, of launching uh, for the Reconnaissance Office. Other folks that we don't, uh, I haven't decided not to dive into, I talked a little bit about DARPA. Um, their budget by themselves is about $2.83 billion, um, focused on new technology development. The National Geospatial Intelligence Agency is really interesting. Their budget is classified. Uh, estimates are about $5 billion. Um, but they aggregate and are, they've been actually a really important potential customer for a lot of the new commercial satellite operators because part of their, their mandate is to aggregate data um, from any source. So whereas the NRO is going out and building purpose-built satellites, the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, or NGA, is buying commercial satellite data, buying uh, capabilities, uh, whether it's satellite or not, fusing it all together, and then using that to come up with information. So that's a pretty, uh, pretty big fish for like a lot of the small satellite constellations want to want to sell to that group. Uh, as we've talked about, FCC is in, involved with managing spectrum, and the Environmental Protection Agency uh, has a sort of a dog in the fight in terms of environmental impact. Uh, but traditionally, that's going to be routed through the FAA. <clears throat> and then, I think kind of the biggest regulatory question, which we touched on earlier, is who ultimately has authority for on-orbit operations, right? Does somebody have the ability to tell a commercial operator that they have to move their spacecraft, right? And if they do tell them they have to and they move and they still are in a collision, who's responsible, right? So there's a lot of liability, insurance questions. There's regulatory questions in industry to some extent has stepped up and sort of self-regulated in a lot of ways um, to talk to each other, but especially at GEO, to say like, hey, where's your satellite? Where's your, like, let's not hit each other. Um, but in other orbits, especially lower Earth orbits, the, the speeds are a lot higher and the uncertainties are a lot higher. So it's a, a, a big problem. We'll see how it shakes out. Uh, to get back to the spectrum piece, and, and I think uh, we'll have uh, a, a ch some charts that talk about this. Uh, I have some charts to talk about this, and Dr. Nettleton will be talking about sort of the frequency deconflicting. Um, but the F ITU, which we've mentioned, uh, part of the United Nations allocates orbital slots as well as sort of global radio frequency allocations. Uh, FCC is our, our domestic regulatory agency, uh, and it, as we were talking about before, great question. Uh, you know, every country or region has something similar, uh, which is a challenge in, in a regulatory sense. We've talked a little bit, too, um, about the European Space Agency and the European Union. And so now we're kind of getting into what's Europe doing in space as opposed to the United States. Um, ESA is actually uh, predates the European Union. So the European countries uh, got together and started working together on space before the formation of the European Union. Uh, and so their structures are a little different, and there's some interesting kind of overlap and in, in, in interrelationships. So ESA is funded by member countries uh, and is mostly autonomous in the sense of what those member countries, I mentioned earlier, the ministers of those countries, ministerial meetings, whatever they say, this is kind of how they do priorities. Um, but they're really focused on the practical, immediate returns of space. So unlike NASA, which is sort of, you know, science, exploration, uh, inspiration, or kind of mandates, the European Space Agency is really concerned about how do we deliver value to Europeans. It also has a, an interesting component, something called just return, which means that each of these member countries uh, is going to contribute some dollar figure every year. And every year, 90% of what they've contributed to ESA has to be awarded to, country, or to companies in their country uh, as a return. So, all, like, so, for example, if France puts a billion dollars into ESA, $900 million has to be awarded to French companies. And so you get an interesting dynamic there uh, of... Germany and France have a lot of space companies. Uh, Spain and Italy, less so, right? So in those smaller countries where the, the industrial base isn't so huge, in some ways you actually have less competition for business because a certain amount of money has to go back, uh, which creates some interesting decisions on, on how, they, uh, how they award contracts. Uh, conversely, the European Union which does a fair bit in space as well, they competitively award contracts. So if, you're apply if there's a contract uh, being solicited, a solicitation from the EU, that's just going to go to the lowest cost, best provider. doesn't care about uh, just return or anything like that. Uh, 
An example uh, of some of this interrelationship is the Galileo program, um, sort of the equivalent of GPS for Europe, uh, is funded by the EU, but is executed and built and operated by the European Space Agency. Uh, so I think that the amount of money is something in the order of like 30 or uh, 40 percent of ESA's budget actually comes from the EU. So you get this interesting uh, component of what contracts and activities have to can be concerned about just return versus what don't. Uh, and the agreement between ESA and the EU and how this stuff all works expires, uh, we're set to expire this year. Uh, and I haven't followed up on it, but I'm sure it was renewed or we would have heard about it. Um, the other thing that complicates Europe in sort of the space world is that a lot of these countries also, they support it through support space, through the EU, through ESA, and then also through their own domestic space program. So in general, EU and ESA are not uh, concerned with the national security space piece. So a lot of these countries want to have their own intelligence satellites, their own defense uh, communications capabilities. Uh, but they're also uh, just countries, uh, you know, France and, and Germany are two examples, where they have their own space uh, programs. In, in France, it's CNES. Uh, in, in Germany, it's DLR. And they're doing their own space stuff in partnership with the EU and ESA, but also sometimes just totally independent of it. So a lot of uh, complicating sort of uh, interrelationships in Europe. <clears throat> and now I'll spend a couple minutes talking about um, I get this question a lot, sort of, where, do I, where, do, where should I go? What kind of entities should I look at to understand what's going on in commercial space, what events are, are relevant? So there's a lot of entities out there that, that talk about commercial space. Uh, this is by no means exhaustive, but these are sort of the four that I would recommend for different reasons. So Commercial Space Flight Federation uh, is a consortium of companies that operate in commercial uh, space flight. It used to be called the Personal Space Flight Federation. Uh, and so these are like your suborbital and orbital providers of crew and cargo. They don't put out a conference, but they do have a lot of information. So like if you were looking to say, I want to get into commercial human space flight, go look at their member list. That's pretty much everybody who's doing commercial human space flight. The Satellite Industry Association, totally other end of the spectrum. This is where the communication satellite companies are. Um, this is the sort of industry advocacy group for all the big telecommunications components of space. Um, the Aerospace Industries Association is looking at the sort of a lot of the suppliers and the workforce uh, capabilities. Uh, and the Space Foundation, which is based down in Colorado Springs, uh, is really focused, is a nonprofit focused on educational outreach, but really with a heavy flavor of uh, national security space. So they have a big conference in uh, April time frame every year. It's, it's really where like a lot of the national security globally kind of are coming together to talk. And there's a, a link here, um, which is an, a, a kind of a calendar of all the space events and conferences and meetings that are going on. Uh, it's pretty well updated. Um, if that link doesn't work, let me know, and I'll go double check uh, if it maybe has changed slightly. Um, but that's a great reference if you're trying to figure out, like, hey, what conferences should I be going to? What events are worth keeping on my radar? Um, I recommend checking that out uh, for a pretty comprehensive list. So we'll end uh, with some discussion on sort of private investors and donors. And we've already talked about the idea of kind of billionaire space, um, but, I, but this chart specifically, I wanted to kind of put some context that is not particularly new or novel that rich people uh, or wealthy families are involved in space. So these are three uh, examples um, from the last couple hundred years. Uh, James Lick uh, dedicated $700,000 to the construction of the Lick Observatory uh, in California, uh, and that $700,000 is equivalent to $1.2 billion contribution today you know, for adjustment, inflation, and all that stuff. So pretty, uh, you know, pretty big deal. Uh, Andrew Carnegie, uh, you probably know as a sort of a steel tycoon, um, but he contributed more than $1.4 million to the Mount Wilson Solar Observatory, which if we adjust that's about $630 million today. So pretty impressive. And uh, Daniel Guggenheim um, was one of the main funders of Robert Goddard, um, about $36 million. And, and Robert Goddard was, the, was sort of the grandfather of liquid propulsion and rockets. So not a necessarily a new thing that people are involved in space who have the means uh, to be. So here's some examples. We've talked about some of these, but we'll go through. Um, Robert Bigelow uh, is working on inflatable space habitats. We'll get on, talked about that a little bit later in the semester. Paul Allen is involved in a couple different ways. Uh, was your sort of funder behind Spaceship One. Uh, uh, runs a company called Strata Launch, where they're building the world's largest aircraft. 
to drop a rocket, to do an air launch uh, orbital vehicle. Um, I'm told the aircraft has been built. <clears throat> and as much as I love rockets, I really just want to see that thing fly because it's, it's like massive uh, aircraft. Uh, I forget the wingspan, but it's incredible. Um, he also has a company called Vulcan Aerospace, which does uh, a lot of investment and uh, different things for, for satellite technology. Jeff Bezos, uh, we've talked about for the context of Blue Origin, but independently funded something called the Apollo Recovery Project, uh, which is pretty neat. Uh, they went out and fished out the Apollo engines uh, from the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, recovered them uh, mostly intact, and they're putting them in a museum in Seattle, which is really cool. So we're trying to recover some of the space history. Uh, Elon Musk in SpaceX, apparently at least one person in the class has, has spent hours reading about him, so we might have to get a guest lecture about that. Uh, Richard Branson, uh, obviously in Virgin Galactic. Um, a couple, one that I think people don't realize is Bill Gates was actually invested in space, like sort of uh, the last time it was cool, which a company called Teledesic, where they were going to launch uh, hundreds of satellites to do communications around the globe. Uh, it didn't quite work out. He hasn't come back. Uh, Dennis Tito uh, was a, um, uh, a private space explorer, bought a ticket to go to the space station, uh, also was the, the money behind the concept uh, Inspiration Mars, which was the idea of sending, commercially sending a husband and wife to Mars uh, on a re free return trajectory, um, which I thought was kind of interesting because, well, the caveat there is like, is that really what you want to do is spend, you know, two and a half years in a small tin can with your wife or husband? <laughs> like, maybe not, but... Uh, interesting. Uh, and then um, the other one here I put, which is sort of a big open one, uh, is the idea of Silicon Valley employees. And so one of the caveats uh, of the tech boom that sort of happened in the, in the 2000s is that traditionally when we have technology uh, breakthroughs, bankers and investors get rich. Uh, the difference sort of this time around is that the technical engineers and software people got rich. And so there's a lot of multimillionaires from Facebook and Google and all these other companies in the valley and then now kind of leaving the valley because it's so expensive to live there. But they have millions of dollars and are technically motivated and interested in space. So there's a lot of angel investment going on of people who made their money from Facebook or whatever. Uh, but their passion, their dream, they were always kind of tech geeks and they're, you know, a Trekkie or whatever and they want to help support space. So there's a, a, a new wave kind of of these investors which I think we'll see more and more of uh, in companies as things go forward. So last thing, uh, and then I have a two-minute cool video for anyone. Uh, so discussions are weekly. Um, so every Sunday night, make sure you've uh, put in a contribution by Sunday. I recommend you do it earlier. Um, the first assignment is due Tuesday, September 6th by 5 p.m. Uh, as a PDF, don't forget. Uh, and before I click to the next chart, I'll see if there's any questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. So if you saw an interesting news article or you have an interesting question or you're working on something that you find, you know, you think the class might find interesting, it's totally free form. So uh, that's kind of the interest, the neat part of it. Uh, and as we're going, it'll, like, you can carry over week to week. So there, there will be a new discussion board, but you can contribute to prior discussions as well. But, yeah, but the idea is whatever you find interesting. Uh, and then hopefully, you know, some segment of the class has new ideas, and some segment of the class has opinions on those ideas. And that's sort of where it goes back and forth. Great question, though. Any other questions? Okay, let's see if this works. Uh, it's only like two minutes, and I think you'll like it. Oh, man. <laughs> Whoever says yes to those things. <laughs> So I queued up, uh, if it loads, and I'll try to do this in every once in a while. There's just some cool videos. You might have seen them, but, oh. This is the video from the Lord. Third flight, actually. Five, four, command engine start. Two, one, zero. Lift off. Your shepherd is clear of the tower. Next to you. PM confirmed separation, 250,000 feet.
Apogee 339,000 feet. They have some more stuff if you're interested on their website, um, which is kind of interesting. The the cool kind of added content to that is I've been ribbing all my friends who are at SpaceX that you know they've got the launch land piece down, but they haven't gotten the repeat right. Like so, it's egg them on a little bit. And I think they announced today that someone bought the one of the rockets that they landed, uh, and later this year they'll try to repeat. So it'll be really interesting to see how that goes. But uh, have a great one. I'll see you on Thursday. I don't think they released uh, how much it, it cost, yeah, but um, there was a funny...